During aging, levels of the transcription factor, NRF2 or NERF2, decline. And that's potentially important because an age-related decline for NERF2 impacts many hallmarks of aging, which then impact many age-associated diseases. So can we reverse the age-related decline for NERF2 expression? And interestingly, one uh, dietary factor that may impact NERF2 expression is sulforaphane, which is found in broccoli, but to a larger extent in broccoli sprouts. And we'll get into that data later in the video. But first, sulforaphane increases NERF2 expression, which is what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got relative expression of NERF2 plotted against the sulforaphane SFN concentration at zero, so none, no sulforaphane, three and six micromolar. And we can see that sulforaphane at three and six micromolar increases NERF2 expression almost twofold higher when compared with no sulforaphane at all. And that's potentially important because it suggests that it could increase NERF2 expression, potentially re uh, reducing or reducing the uh, effect of the hallmarks of aging on age-related diseases. But more specifically, can sulforaphane impact lifespan? And in fact, sulforaphane increases lifespan in aged mice. And more specifically, the aged mice were 21 to 22 months old. In terms of the lifespan, that's what we'll see here with percent survival on the y-axis plotted against time in weeks on the x. Now for survival studies, we usually look at 50% survival or median survival. That's the red line there. That's the time when half the colony has died and half is still alive. They didn't evaluate that in this study. They looked at 75% survival instead. This is the time when 25% of the colony had died and 75% was still alive. At that time point, when starting with the control diet, we can see that five of the 20 mice that they included for the lifespan analysis had died. But in contrast, for the sulforaphane SFN uh, containing diet, and in terms of the content, it was 442.5 milligrams of sulforaphane for, per kilogram food, we can see that mice fed sulforaphane, all of them were still alive at that time point. None of them had died. You can see that green line is flat. So no mice fed sulforaphane had died, whereas five mice on the control, my, uh, control diet had died. And rather than just looking at two groups of data and numbers, we've got the statistics, which this is a statistically significant difference for sulforaphane increasing lifespan, at least 25% survival. Now, increasing lifespan is one thing, but a common theme in the longevity space is, are you living longer and healthier or just longer with more uh, disease or poor health and frail? So in this study, they showed that sulforaphane improves muscle strength and endurance in aged mice, which is what we'll see here. And the first test that they used was a wire hanging test. So the mice are gripping onto the wire and how long that they're able to hold on is a measure of grip strength, but also grip endurance. So in terms of how long the mice are able to hold on, they measured that in time. And then we have two groups. They actually looked at young, in this case, and old, young being two months old. And then again, the old being 21 to 22 months old. So first in the young mice, supplementing them with sulforaphane didn't impact grip hang time. But we can see in the old mice that were fed sulforaphane, they had a significant increase in the grip hang time, which is again, a measure of strength and endurance when compared with the non-supplemented mice with sulforaphane. All right, so what about a more specific test of endurance? So to test that, they looked, they ran mice on a treadmill with the data shown here. Now body weight can affect the ability uh, of mice to run. So to account for that, they measured treadmill work. So work equals force times distance. The force in this case is body weight. The distance is meters run on the treadmill. So work equals body weight times meters run on the treadmill. So again, they looked at young and old. And again, we can see that sulforaphane supplementation in the young mice didn't impact treadmill work. But for old mice that were fed sulforaphane, it increased aerobic exercise capacity. All right, so that, that brings us then to what's a potential human equivalent dose. And, and in order to address that question, we've got to take a look at Bro the, answering the question for broccoli sprouts versus broccoli, which is best for sulforaphane content. And as far as I know, there's only one study that's done a head-to-head -head, uh, matchup, which is shown here, where they looked at sulforaphane content in both broccoli and broccoli sprouts. So first, they looked at two different types of broccoli in both the florets and the stems. And if we take the av average between those four measurements, it's somewhere in the and assuming an equal mix. So we're assuming we're eating the whole broccoli, not just the heads, but the heads and the stems and an equal mix of that. 
So based on that, we'd expect about 93 milligrams of sulforaphane per 100 grams of broccoli. But as I mentioned, they also included broccoli sprouts in this study. And we can see that broccoli sprouts have about 12 times more sulforaphane when compared with broccoli. Now, another question to ask is though, uh, how old were the broccoli sprouts? And that's important because they bought broccoli and the broccoli sprouts from the market. So how long is the food sitting on the shelf? Who knows, right? So, and that's potentially important because as we'll see, age of the broccoli sprouts and how old the seeds are or how much, you know, the time from germination is important in terms of sulforaphane content, which is what we'll see here. So germination time on the left with sulforaphane content on the right. And I should say for these data, I wasn't familiar with the, the, uh, this paper, but shout out to Lumbus or Sky LT Dokken on YouTube, who was making a point about trigonelline content in seeds versus sprouts and pointed me to this paper on sulforaphane seeds versus sprouts. So thanks to uh, Lumbus uh, or your, uh, you know, your handle Sky LT Dokken. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but shout out. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate you uh, posting that in the comments. So in going back to the study, we can see that the highest level of sulforaphane is actually in broccoli seeds, you know, with 3,600 micrograms per gram of broccoli seed, which then uh, declines by about 12-fold to broccoli sprouts that are five days old after sprouting them. So if you're eating, eating fresh sprouts five days as soon as they're ready to be uh, eaten after five days, you're getting very low levels of sulforaphane. So it's important to eat broccoli sprouts that are somewhere between five and 11 days old, as we can see that then sulforaphane content starts to increase after day five, up to about 1500, 1,500 micrograms per gram. All right, so what's the HEV or the human equivalent dose? So we can calculate that. And I'm gonna use the study on the bottom because the, you can see that the units are different. On the bottom, it's micrograms per gram, whereas on the top, it's milligrams per 100 grams. They're not, they're not identical in their units. So on the bottom, that 1,055 micrograms per gram is actually equal to one milligram per gram. So in terms of the human equivalent dose, we can calculate that as multiplying 442.5 milligrams of sulforaphane per kilogram food. Aged mice eat about four grams of food per day, which is 0 0.004 kilograms. And I know that because I just published, we, our group just published a study in aged mice. So we measured food intake and it's about four grams of food per day or 0 0.004 kilograms. So multiplying 442.5 times 0 0.004 and then dividing that by the body surface area conversion for mice to humans of 12.3, we get a human equivalent dose based on the animal study that extended 25% survival of 144 milligrams of sulforaphane per day. Now, I prefer to get it from Whole Foods as the start. So when considering the study on the bottom, the Lopez Cervantes study, one milligram, around one milligram of sulforaphane per gram of broccoli sprouts would yield about 140 grams of broccoli sprouts to get about 144 milligrams of sulforaphane per day. So that'll be in the approach until the next blood test. I've got to work my, my way up to 144 grams uh, as I just started sprouting them. So uh, I started off with 60, a, a batch died, so now I'm regrowing them and I'm gonna to have to grow a lot more and reduce alfalfa sprout uh, intake. But I'm excited to get started on the sulfur, sulforaphane experiment, especially for things like telomere length as, as sulforaphane, again, increases expression of nerve 2 which is well known to increase antioxidant defense uh, enzymes and oxidative stress can limit telomere length. So it's possible that by including bro broccoli sprouts, I may get an extension of telomere length or at least the DNA methylation estimation of telomere length that I've been using with uh, true, di true diagnostic. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, which includes blood test con consults, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links that you may be interested in, including discount links for epigenetic testing, NED quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with CyFox Health, which includes ApoB, but also GrimAge, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.